Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today, and welcome to the Youth Resilience in the Digital Age Conference. On behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada, we would like to recognize the contributions of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada. In honour of reconciliation in education, we acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples whose lands we are on today. My name is Jamili Baroud and I am the Program Officer for the Canadian Teachers Federation. I'll be responsible for moderating this session today from Vancouver, British Columbia. Before we start, I'd like to, rec like to recognize that this initiative was made possible by funding from Employment and Social Development Canada and that this week's conference is proudly co-hosted by the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada. Please also note that today's session will be recorded and available on the conference website by Tuesday of next week. And that today's session isn't English, but the platform allows you to listen in French. So at the bottom of the screen, a choice of French interpretation is available. Voyez noter que la session aujourd'hui se déroule en anglais, mais la plateforme vous permet d'écouter en français. Au bas de l'écran, un choix d'interprétation en français vous est offert. If you are using translation, an option to mute the original sound is available in your interpretation menu. So a short Q&A period will follow the presentation. Uh, please use the Q&A function to ask questions to the presenter or to communicate with technical staff. Please also feel free to use the chat function to connect with other participants, share resources and interact. At the end of the presentation, I'll invite the presenter to answer your questions in the order that they were asked. And now, I'm glad to welcome Bianca West. Originally from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, she heads up Achievers Professional Services and is responsible for creating the infrastructure to deliver on managing field readiness activities and the associated growth plan. Bianca is now located out of London, UK. Inspiring women in business is something that Bianca is passionate about. And her role as chair of the Achievers Women's Network allows her to facilitate the advancement of women working at Achievers. Bianca and the AWN team put passion into practice through information sharing, best practices, education, and experience. Her presentation today is called Disrupting Digital Inequities, a Youth-Centered Approach. Welcome, Bianca, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jamili. All right. I just want to confirm before I get started that you can see my screen properly. Perfect. So hello everyone and again thank you Jamili and a big shout out to the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Club of Canada and the coalition stakeholders for having me. I've had the pleasure of listening in to some of the content from this conference and I can't express enough how important I believe these discussions are. As Jamili mentioned, I have the pleasure of leading the Achievers Professional Services team that partners with our clients who are headquartered out of our EMEA headquarters. And really the team's goal is to design and implement our employee video, um, sorry, employee voice and recognition programs. As you can tell by my accent, I'm originally from Oakville, Ontario. However, as Jimily mentioned, I'm calling in today from London, England, as I currently live and work here and have since 2018 with my husband. So before I get started, I'll spend a bit of time just giving you a background on what Achievers is and, and really what we do. So we're an employee voice and recognition solution. We bring organizational values and strategies to life by activating employees' participation and accelerating a culture of performance. Achievers leverages the science-based behavior change so that your people and your organization can experience sustainable data-driven business results. Now, I've been in the engagement technology space for almost nine years, and some of the most cherished experiences that I have is meeting our new partners, 
getting immersed in their organization and being part of the team of change makers who are helping to evolve and curate their organization's culture through our technology. I've seen firsthand how a really strong culture at a tech company um, and you know many other industries that makes it feel like you're the right fit for the right business and it makes you feel excited to be part of a team to stay with an organization and that magic really happens when your personal values and your organizational values align. I also chair our women's network and the Achievers Women's Network has been part of one of the reasons I love going to work um, and I've been participating as the chair of it since 2016. Today I work with about 30 other employees who are as dedicated as I am to disrupting the norm, addressing diversity within the tech ecosystem. And just so you know, I will likely refer to the Women's Network as AWN, um, as the Achievers Women's Network or ON. So bear with me through the presentation. The Achievers Women's Network was created to share information, best practices, education, and experience. And all of those things are meant to develop leadership skills and career advancing opportunities really needed to drive success. We strive to provide a safe space for persons of any group or identity striving for universal equality inside and outside of the workplace. And that's really why I'm here speaking to you today. There is an opportunity to share my experiences, not only into the tech industry, but also with technology itself and hopefully spark a dream for any of the youth listening in who may not see a direct path for themselves into STEM related fields or even pursuing roles as innovators, as creators and as leaders. And through my volunteer work with the Women's Network, we constantly are working to reframe the messaging and really to provide safe spaces for individuals to ask questions, create initiatives to promote emotional well-being, representation, and mentorship. And the focus of that team is directly aligned to the objective of this conference, resiliency. So if you apply some of the approaches that I talk about that we apply through the Women's Network, I have no doubt that you'll see how approaching online safety is also a grassroots initiative. I have also no doubt that you can creatively continue to disrupt inequitable opportunities, generate safe and innovative evolution and enhance diversity for youth spaces online. So AWN's focus and in partnership with other like-minded tech companies through initiatives that we run, our aim is to really band together to center in, invest in, and hear from and learn from youth to help disrupt digital inequities as well, which is why I'm speaking to you here today. So I'll begin this talk with a shameless plug of a childhood picture, but also um, with the intention of providing a little bit of background on me and sort of my approach to technology. I'm a first-generation Canadian born to a Jamaican mother and an Antiguan father. And of all of the intentional, brilliant qualities and lessons that my parents worked to bestow on my, um, you know, my siblings and I, one of those things wasn't the intricacies and layers of online safety. And it's not that they didn't teach us the basics, in any way, shape or form. To be quite honest, for my father at the time, one of the most important things was making sure that we turned off the computer so as not to rise the electricity bill. But it's more that the access to information about online safety, the ability to make it approachable wasn't something that they had at their fingertips. So as I got older, it wasn't that online safety didn't come up even in, at home, 
but my parents really didn't have the time to understand the layered dangers of the internet, nor was, as I mentioned, access to that information approachable. So we were entrusted to do what we thought was right, the same way that we were entrusted to do what we thought was right when we were outside of the household and, and not online. So because of that, growing up, I learned how to navigate online safety really the hard way. And fortunately for me, it worked out. I came out on the other side unscathed. And to be quite frank, my generational concerns with technology were ensuring that your online brand matched your career ambitions. And really what that means is completely cleansing your Facebook before applying for a job at a university. And looking back, I believe that if my parents had information that you know, somebody had shared with them or made accessible to them to share with me about how to navigate online safety, I would have directly been impacted by that. And I think this still holds true for families today in a much more dangerous online world than what I had growing up. Parents need to have the basics delivered to them, have the knowledge of how to battle this at their fingertips and ideally from their peer groups and educators who they're expecting to get that information from anyway. It really would have leveled the playing field. And any tools through a meaningful communication channel, which means channels that people are naturally accessing and that are made to be easily understood that share the risks of technology is really all that is needed. And one of the things I also want to highlight is that the lack of privilege to invest time in learning these things yourselves as a parent is really something that still holds true for today's parents. So Take the McKinsey and Company report as an example. They released a Woman in the Workplace 2020 study. And this data set for 2020 reflects contributions from 317 companies that participated and more than 40,000 people who they surveyed on their workplace experiences. And they had more than 45 in-depth interviews which were also conducted to dive deeper into the issues I'm about to mention. So as everybody listening in knows, the events of 2020 has turned workplaces completely upside down. And really there is this challenge, not only to work while in a pandemic, but also many employees are struggling to, to do their jobs. They're feeling always on, now that the boundaries between work and home have completely blurred and they're worried about their family's health, their finances, burnout is a real issue. And for women of color who are primary caregivers and working, they're also shouldering heavier burdens than their white mother counterparts in these workspaces. According to the study, they are more likely to be their family's sole breadwinner or to have partners working outside of the home during COVID-19. They're doing so much at home, and in most cases, so much more at home. According to the study, Latina mothers are 1.6 times more likely than white mothers to have to be responsible for childcare and housework, and Black mothers are twice as likely to be handling all of this for their family. So, why am I mentioning this to you? Because I know that not all access to information is created equal, the same way that not all online spaces are created equal. So not only do we need to think about and create content for children of color, but we also need to be mindful of how their families can best access that information in a digestible way. So I still remember why I joined the Achievers Women's Network. I wanted to be immersed and held accountable for being immersed in content that captured the real experiences of women in the workforce and specifically women in tech. I was searching for representation 
authentic discourse, and to be able to access a group of like-minded people to help me keep the momentum that I desire. And as we reflect on, again, the theme of this conference, resiliency, I urge you to find your community for online safety discussions as well. Can it be your friend group? Can it be like-minded classmates for any of the youth listening in, your siblings, your family? And once you find that community, you'll need to adjust and you'll need to pivot to keep up with the changing face of technology as well. And having a really good support group can help with that. As an example, in an effort to pivot the Achievers Women's Network um, based on moving all of our initiatives online in a response to COVID-19, we shared a digital series called Behind the Technology, Achieving Resilience, and I'm sharing with you some of the stills of our recent episodes. This is a bi-weekly interview that we release, and it features our leaders across the organization discussing how they maintain resilience. And again, as you know, we're talking about resiliency in online spaces, and that mindset that not only you'll pick up today, you'll also be able to apply that to future spaces where resiliency is going to be the most important thing to maintain the momentum that you're interested in. And this is a screenshot of an example of, of one episode that we published and you can see that it's on Instagram. And we chose Instagram because it's a platform, as we all know, that is one of the most popular ones that everybody uses. It's such a connection tool. And even though the content that we're releasing is focused on Achievers employees, we make the interviews accessible online and available to anyone interested in learning about these great leaders. Our goal is to democratize the learning. So looping back to what I said earlier, this is also what I challenge you to do with all of the content that we're discussing here today and that you've heard throughout the conference. I really believe that this approach to democratize learning can be adopted by adults who are supporting youth navigating online safety, by youth themselves. You'll just need to get a little bit creative. Enter spaces that you know your children and peers use every day and share this information back. And you know, like the AWN community, you can work with one another to do exactly what our mission says share best practices, experiences, and really ensure that not only are you sharing it amongst yourselves, but families that could benefit um, from that information is also um, available to have access to that. And the way that I'd like to sort of summarize this section is that AWN or the Achievers Women's Network is our way of putting critical thinking into action. It's approaching it as a group, we're learning together. And I really believe that sharing digestible content in this way benefits everyone. It is a grassroots initiative. So how can you do your part to ensure that information from this conference even is publicly accessible as an example? That these sessions can reach families you partner with and that that information is collected in a digestible way. Maybe share an audio version so parents can listen in while going about their daily tasks. The first step is really just bringing up the discussions and thinking about what you can do. So, as I mentioned earlier, through AWN, we strive to provide a safe space for persons of any group or identity striving for universal equality inside and outside of the workplace. So let's talk about teaching children about effects of systemic racism online and through technology. For many parents of children of color, this is a discussion that typically happens very early on and tech diversity and inclusion issues fit right into this discussion. What's important for children to know is that racial diversity doesn't magically happen. It's something that we all need to actively work on and what the creators of technologies they frequent also need to actively work on and prioritize. Products do always reflect the values of the creators, 
whether it's intentional or not intentional. And products should work for everyone, no matter what you look like. Um, I wanna share an example with you. I recently attended a Zoom birthday party for my mother-in-law and we had celebratory backgrounds, the works and being in the UK and in a very strict lockdown, this was a very exciting time. And what I quickly noticed was that if I moved even slightly to the left or to the right with my Zoom background on, I actually became invisible. And this didn't obviously affect how much fun that party was. But after a little research, I realized that this was really common and common for black people. And it was pretty clear that Zoom's virtual background feature isn't built for black faces. In late September, as an example, a PhD student in Canada tweeted about a black professor who had kept getting removed every time they tried to use a virtual background. The tweet went viral and countless black and dark skinned people started sharing their difficulties that were very, very similar. And the thing is the Zoom background relies on facial recognition technology. And if it's not built for everybody, then not everybody can participate it in it equally. And the intersection of these emerging technologies and racial biases, whether they're intentional or not, are something that we need to begin speaking to our children about. I wanna acknowledge that this is not only to just share a story, but it's also to spark something in you for the youth listening in. I highly encourage the younger folks listening to consider a career in technology so that you can be part of these positive outcomes of how diversity and inclusion can show up online. In the book that my dear friend shared with me, technology or technically wrong, I should say, the writer discusses that having diversity in tech companies is not the answer alone. She states that you also have to be willing to create technology in a way that society should be and can be. There's a movement, there's an evolution to working in STEM. And again, for the youth listening in, you could be part of the teams who are investigating and creating solutions where scenarios like the one I just mentioned um, are being tackled. You can be at the tables asking questions like, is the data that we're basing this technology on inclusive of a range of skin tones? Seems like a simple question. Does our product fail more often for different kinds of images? Those are the questions that you can bring to the table and your personal identity and background and experience is going to help impact those discussions and also be why technology is moving in a more diverse and inclusive way. Inclusive way. And I really want to acknowledge that it's always, it's not always easy is what I wanted to say. And this is an example of Dr. Gieber and she was working at Google and she brought up some inequities and she ended up being fired. And Google fired her after she had sent out an email that criticized the company's lack of progress in hiring women and minorities and biases built into its artificial intelligence technology. She also demanded an explanation from the company as to why she was told by leadership to retract a paper that pinpointed flaws in a new breed of language technology, including a system built by Google that underpins the company's search engine. Now, this is Google. And if it can happen at Google, then every tech company is possibly, you know, it could end up in the same spot. And it's not to mean anybody is bad intention, but without diverse and includes people making technology and impacting it, whether you're an ally or an individual who you're representing. But with, without that, 
you know, these problems can't be solved. So I know you've heard quite a bit over the conference about, you know, really what youth need to understand. Values and ideologies that digital systems advance, the interests that digital systems serve, who has the power and why. Um, and the reason they need to know that is so that they can critique the internet in a way that they personally use it. So the question, how digital systems are designed isn't always clear cut, but at the same time, it's approachable when you're focused on an app or technology that you use every day. And so how do we answer these questions? What I wanna to say to you is don't be overwhelmed. You do not have to solve for the entire internet. Simply start with the tools that you use, that your siblings use, that your children use right now. So I wanna share with you an example. My friend and colleague shared a story with me recently that is relevant to understanding why children need to know how to think critically about what they're consuming even if they don't have all of the other layers underpinned, but at least the initial thinking about it. So he was telling me how in the new post COVID world, homeschooling content is made available on YouTube. And that's really the new normal. And that if you're not watching your kids, there are all of these other suggestions that come up based on what they've been instructed to watch. And the common downside with sending your kids to YouTube to do learning is that they're going to be interested very naturally in all of the other things that YouTube has to offer. So if they click on content that's not meant for them, they could end up watching something violent, which could have ripple effects. And it doesn't always have to be that extreme, but there are instances where it is. And primary caregivers need to be mindful that the incentive of these companies is to keep people on their platform. And for the youth listening in, this example matters to you as well. You're likely going to be the first person to spot your sibling clicking on something that they shouldn't or that could have negative impacts on them. Another story that my friend shared with me was that his kids love watching airplanes landing and taking off. And usually from their condo, they can see the airplanes um, really, really easily. But with COVID-19, there are less flights and with lockdown, they can't just naturally and easily go to the airport due to the stay at home orders. So to overcome this, he decided to put on a YouTube video that was titled Airplanes Landing and Taking Off for Kids. And right before walking away, he luckily and quickly noticed that the next set of recommendations were top 10 most dangerous landings. And another was the scariest takeoffs and landings. Suggestions like this are meant to keep people engaged. And the algorithms that create these suggestions do not have context into the age of the individual, what they're allowed to be watching, they're focused on meeting their creator's bottom line, keeping people engaged. And really because of this very, very simple example, youth need to be able to not only be able to question what they're watching, but have avenues to learn what to trust. So how do you get to learn what to trust and what not to trust? And taking a page out of the Achievers Women's Network handbook, I truly believe it's all about having discussions. So I asked my 13 year old nephew in preparation for today to tell me what concerned him about online spaces. It's very important to note that this is not my nephew and this is just a representation of how my nephew will forever live in my mind. So what he shared with me as far as what he was interested to learn about online based on discussions he'd had with his mother were how to spot danger that wasn't obvious, how to avoid being traumatized by seeing something that he shouldn't, how to safely make friends online who are similar ages and who share similar values, and how to work through peer pressure and bullying online. And these are great things to know about. I was so happy 
to be able to have this discussion with him and him inform me even. But it dawned on me, there are things that he also didn't list that I would like him to know. And they're the deeper layers of the internet that all parents should be equipped with understanding and really what this entire conference is about. So what, what should children be thinking about? Um, and it really, for when I think about my family, when I think about my experiences online, and when I think about underrepresented people um, in the tech spaces and online communities, it's really online intersectionality. What are spaces where some people are welcome versus spaces where some people are not? And my Zoom example was funny, but there are other stories that aren't really that funny. Um, and another example that's really close to home probably for everybody listening in is just the simple fact that not all apps and technologies have emojis or avatars of diverse skin tones. And this is important to acknowledge in discussions with children because that simple lack thereof can make people feel invisible or that they're not normal. And for folks listening in whose skin color hasn't contributed to why your life is hard, acknowledging these inequalities, speaking up about them, acting on them, is how you can show your allyship in a really positive way. Representation and identities can form online. Therefore, diversifying the tech ecosystem is important. And talking about how it currently isn't diverse is equally as important to creating confident people. Another thing youth should be concerned about is the fact that at one point or another, they will make mistakes online, which could have ripple effects and it can affect their mental well being, could cause feelings of shame, regret, embarrassment. So, I want you to think about how you can go and reach out to somebody for the youth listening in who you can be honest with, that you can trust, has your best intentions at heart. And I welcome you after this discussion to let them know that they are that person for you. Talk about how they would like to be approached if a situation occurred like the one I just described. So you can prepare yourself. How these experiences occur can be complicated. How you feel about them can be complicated. And preparing yourself beforehand to combat these difficult and challenging discussions ahead of time can really help you course correct and also allow you when things are actually really difficult to know that you have a support system built in. And we do this through the Achievers Women's Network as well. We created and manage our organization's mentorship program. And it's a program where people are partnered to tackle challenges related to developing and building workplace skills, managing work-life balance, and developing workplace relationships. So again, the skills you learn in proactively finding your person to help you through a difficult scenario, they're skills that you'll continue to use. Feeling unsafe is something that you should prepare yourself for. And it's a feeling that's pretty instinctual. And you just know something's not right. And rather than being pushed out of that space because you feel unsafe, you can also rely on someone you trust to help you navigate that. Just ask for help, even if it feels uncomfortable. Know that that feeling is common even among adults, whether it's feeling unsafe, being excluded, feeling alienated, being bullied. Technologies can really prompt these feelings and society can prompt these feelings. And because society impacts technology, you can use these skills to really equip yourself in both spaces. We put on an event through the Achievers Women's Network titled Only Person in the Room. And this was an event to acknowledge that even in the most 
diverse and innovative communities, people carry with them experiences where they felt like the only person in the room, when they felt alienated or excluded. And the intention of the discussion was not only to have it to and to acknowledge it, but to also talk about those people who ended up being, you know, support systems, the allies who spoke up, the friends who, you know, didn't want to stand by while something was happening to somebody because they were different. And this discussion that you'll have with your support system when you're feeling on, unsafe online is really, really similar. You can also be controlled by the content that you see. Whether it's obvious marketing or not, we are on our phones, we are on apps, we're using technology all day long. And this can have an influence over what you can believe is true. Images on Instagram portraying perfect image, like lifestyles, I should say, getting news through social media apps without knowing the source. All of this can really have a negative impact on how you see the world without you even knowing it. So thinking critically, as discussed in, I believe, the initial keynote, you know, there are different levels of bad, but who decides what the desired outcome is? Where did the data come from? How did they define good and bad? Does this definition leave people behind? These are all questions that you can ask yourself when, you know, wanting to critically question the content you receive or when working through content that's obviously misleading. And thinking twice about the content that comes up as technology is built to encourage users to view things as objective is really important because they're not neutral experiences. They all have a purpose. And as we saw with an earlier example, not even Google searches are objective. Lastly, I'll acknowledge that you should be aware also of your digital footprint. What does that mean? It means that beyond, you know, your professional brand, so like me cleansing your Facebook before getting your first job, it's about your online safety of your data. And because technology is built to hide its flaws, this is not something you always think about. So what happens if your favorite app had a data breach? Is there any information in there that if it was to become public could harm you mentally, financially, personally? These are the questions you need to ask yourself. Your data will be used one day to do very great things, whether it's to buy a home or to go on vacation, whatever it is that you might want in your life. So making sure that where you put your data today as you're using your apps is absolutely something that you should be mindful of. So again, we know that emotional well-being and equal representation is not at the top of mind for every tech company. But what I can say is, I also know that there are companies who are focused on some of the things that we talked about disrupting inequitable opportunities, generating safe and innovative evolution, and enhancing diversity. I happen to work for a tech company that is rooted in workforce science. Um, we have a research and insights uh, entire arm of the business that's called the Workforce Institute that provides thought leadership based in science, in data and research and ensures that our products and services are rooted in behavioral science. So again, my call out to any of the people thinking about their calling and their future and how they can be on the forefront of diversity and inclusion in technology, please consider entering into tech, entering into a STEM role and I know you'll be able to find your company that aligns to your mission and your vision and values, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session. Thank you for your time.
Beyond, I'm just so beyond grateful to have had the opportunity to learn with and from you today. Um, and I hope that everyone listening to this um, incredibly enriching and empowering presentation uh, enjoyed it, of course. So at this point in time, we're going to ask any of the attendees who are listening to write your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box or any comments that you might have for Bianca as well. So it looks like currently we don't have any, but I'll wait a few minutes before we close the session uh, just to save the time for people to type out their questions. So while we wait, Bianca, I do have a question for you about your, the conversation you had with your nephew. So as you know, I have way too many nieces and nephews to count. Um, but when you approached your nephew about the types of online safety issues that you know he had noticed or that he had questions about, um, I'm curious about how you asked, because I do know that like the aunt-nephew relationship is obviously quite special and possibly a little bit different than the one we have with our parents. But how did you approach him and create like that safe space for him to feel comfortable to share that with you? I, I love that question. What's important to note is that I have the utmost respect for my older sister and I absolutely asked her permission and got her opinion first before approaching my nephew about this topic. Um, so that gave me full reins to know that I could have a really authentic discussion with him. Um, and to your point, I, I feel really, really grateful that I can ask him almost anything. He's at the age where it might take him a bit, he might need to reflect on it and come back to me. But he was just a wealth of, of um, knowledge about thinking about it. And what I found to be disheartening was not that he was thinking about these things that he should be, but just that kids are experiencing so much identity formation online. You know, he spoke quite a bit about peer pressures and bullying and, and friend creation. And with the move to being completely on, online, it really made me take pause and realize that it is such a big job that parents have and anybody who are supporting kids who have, um, who, you know, have the intention to protect their well-being. So the conversation was lovely. I left it feeling like I needed a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we all have to prepare for that after the conversation for sure. Thank you, Bianca. I do have one uh, question in the chat. So yeah. what concrete steps can teachers and education workers take to ensure that their students are aware of these online inequities? So in public schools, what actions can teachers take to help their students address them? I love this question and I'm going to answer it the same way that I would in a brainstorm for our Women's Network through initiatives. If you can empower your students to do their own research and make it, you know, fun and give them the accountability to discuss topics that are important to them, I think you'll be pretty shocked. So what I would do in your scenario if I was an educator, which I'm not and have complete respect for all of you, is create an assignment tied to critical thinking, technology, and ask your students to report back to the class on one element that they were shocked to learn about their most favorite application in our technology. And if every student has an assignment, you know, sparse that out through the class term, you could keep that top of mind for an entire, you know, semester or, um, you know, time frame that made sense for your, your plan. That would be one specific way to do it. But the root of what I'm saying is putting the learning in hands of your students. In, in, the, in this space, making them share with you what's important to them first and using that to anchor the discussion is gonna open up the floodgates.
Yeah, they, uh, just a comment here, great concrete examples and thanks for the clear and practical answer. Of course. Um, I do have a, I think a and a here. So do you have any ideas on how programmers or educators can reduce um, digital inequities in their virtual program all identities? And sorry, who were the, the audience that the question was based off of? Um, uh -oh. It says programmers or educators. I'm entirely sure, but I can repeat it. I'll put it in the chat box as well. Thank you. So you can read it and it's a longer question. Yeah, of course. No, that's okay. Yeah. So yeah any um, ideas on Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think our company does really well for our product releases and, um, you know, when we're reviewing our roadmap is having our DNI committee, which is a community of employees across the business of diverse backgrounds, come in and act as a stakeholder committee, ask questions, have enough lead time to reflect on how whatever that product or enhancement is might affect the area of their expertise. And I think allowing that council approach, allowing people outside of that immediate space to give an opinion from a programming perspective is really, really helpful. Um, and something that I think all you know, technology companies should adopt. From an educator perspective, I would approach it the same way that I approach upskilling um, myself on, on leadership. Who are your mentors? Who is in your network? Are those people different to you in how they think, in their background? Can they provide you with a different perspective? And I recommend, again, giving yourself enough time to use those people as your network, as your counsel, to allow time for them to give you a different perspective and for you to adjust your programming or planning um, appropriately. I, I know it sounds so simple and maybe some might even think I'm oversimplifying it, but that really is the first step. And then there's a trickle effect of other things that become obvious that allow you to take action based on what you know, comes out of those discussions. That's a great response. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or the chat box. I might just wait 10 more seconds in case something pops up because that tends to happen to me. It's okay. <laughs> right as I try to close. <laughs> I do want to read out one of the comments in the chat box that popped in as you were chatting and they just mentioned is such an important talk for develop developers to take note of. And I just wanted to make sure I pass that along to you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for questions. That looks like, just making sure. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, of course, we invite everyone listening to view the resources and recordings of the event on the conference page. That is digitalresilience.ca. And to tweet about the conference session using, using hashtag digitalresilience2021 and to take us on social media. So we have that there um, on the screen for all of you. Thanks again to Bianca for answering those questions and for the excellent presentation on how emotional, um, sorry, emotional well-being, democratizing learning, representation, allyship, and mentorship can disrupt digital inequities, generate safe and innovative evolution, and enhance diversity. It was a pleasure to have you with us, and thank you all for attending.